Welcome back to Paul's Tech News. I've missed you all terribly. But enough pillow talk. This week, the news was mostly all about Intel, who revealed that their high-performance XE GPUs will be called ARC, and then they shared details on them and their Alder Lake CPUs at their ARC Architecture Day. Just a coincidence, I'm sure. Meanwhile, AMD has DisplayPort 2.0 and 96-core Genoa CPUs, but no mainstream PCI Express 5.0. NVIDIA is just making sad noises in the corner, and Steve from Gamers Nexus heroically used his body to physically shield us from the volleys of exploding power supplies being lobbed haphazardly in our direction by Gigabyte and by extension Newegg. Metaphorically, of course, our PSUs will blot out the sun. Then we will fight in the shade. Excellent! Today's video is brought to you by MSI's MPG Series Z590 motherboards, built for Intel 11th Gen Core processors. Whether you prefer the blacked out look of the Gaming Plus, the Wi-Fi 6E support of the Edge Wi-Fi, or the extra power for overclocking provided by the Z590 Force or the Carbon Wi-Fi, every board is packed with features like 2.5 gig LAN, 20 gigabit USB 3.2, Audio Boost 5, premium VRM cooling, and of course, PCI Express Gen 4 support with supplemental PCIe power. RGB2? Yes, RGB2. Click the sponsor link in the description for more on the MPG Z590 motherboards from MSI. Sometimes manufacturers go months without talking about their upcoming products, and then sometimes there's an info dump over the course of a week when they really want to draw your attention. Intel kicked off their info dump on Monday with a video revealing the name of their high-performance graphics brand, Arc, with a Z and products called ARC will be available in Q1 2022 instead of the originally planned Q4 2021. So here's the appropriately RGB-themed three-way layout for discrete graphics cards makers in 2022. You have a company, a gaming graphics brand, and then a model number or SKU for an actual graphics card. Green Company is NVIDIA. Their gaming GPU sub-brand is GeForce with an example model number of RTX 3080. Red Company is AMD. Their gaming GPU subbrand is Radeon, with an example model number of RX 6800 XT. And now we complete the circle with blue, represented by Intel, with their gaming GPU subbrand Arc, but model numbers here are still unknown. Intel will still use XE to refer to all of their graphics products, including integrated and compute-focused solutions, but Arc will specifically be used for high-performance discrete parts in desktops and laptops. The first family of Arc GPUs is codenamed Alchemist, is expected in early 2022, and will support DirectX 12 Ultimate features such as ray tracing, mesh shaders, and Tier 2 variable rate shading. Follow-up generations are also in the works with codenames designed to appeal to us nerdy gamers, going alphabetically from Alchemist to Battle Mage, Celestial, and Druid. There was a bit more revealed about ARC's architecture as well, and here, for the sake of brevity, I will defer to the linked Anand Tech articles in the description if you're looking for more details. Intel is doing their best to ride the fine line between educating us all about how their GPU internals can be discussed in quantifiable terms and attempting to avoid direct raw number comparisons with their competitors, and for good reason. Even something as seemingly basic as NVIDIA CUDA cores should not be directly compared between generations of NVIDIA GPUs but people do it anyway, myself included, because how else are you going to make a chart showing gen over gen changes? That said, Intel is changing from talking about execution units in their XE GPUs to XE cores, with the current gen XE core sporting 16 vector engines, 16 matrix engines, some cache, and presumably some of that infamous glue that Intel uses to hold their chips together. Four of these XE cores together make a slice, and up to eight slices can be assembled together to make what will presumably be the highest-end Intel Arc graphics card, with 32 XE cores or 4096 FP32 ALUs. How would that number compare to the number of Radeon shader units or NVIDIA CUDA cores in their GPUs? You shouldn't compare those directly, at least not for now, so wait for more details before speculating, or ideally, actually wait for performance numbers to come out. Arc GPUs will be manufactured on TSMC's N6 node. Intel wasn't done though, they also make CPUs, as you might remember, and some Alder Lake questions were answered at their architecture day on Thursday. Alder Lake is a hybrid design with a combination of performance cores with hyperthreading based on the new Golden Cove microarchitecture and efficiency cores without hyperthreading based on the new Gracemont architecture. 
Again, lots of info shown from Alder Lake packaging with LGA for the desktop and BGA for mobile and ultra mobile applications. Power ranges from nine watts on the ultra mobile side, all the way up to 125 watts, asterisk, on the desktop, depending on your power state, of course. And what seems to be an intelligently scalable design that can provide benefits to many different kinds of systems. If you were wondering what kind of memory Alder Lake will support, the answer is all of them because the memory controller can actually play nice with DDR5 at 4,800 mega transfers per second, DDR4 3,200, LPDDR5 5,200, and LPDDR4X 4,266. Those are the base standards, which means it will be up to the motherboard to physically determine what kind of memory is supported, or if the memory will be integrated onto the motherboard, as is often the case with LP, small form factor, or mobile designs. Alder Lake will be leapfrogging AMD Ryzen with their PCI Express support, though, at least in terms of the standard, as the new chips from Intel will sport 16 lanes of PCIe 5.0 with four additional lanes of PCIe 4.0 for an M.2 SSD or other device. The DMI link for the chipset hasn't been detailed yet, but is likely another effective four lanes of PCIe 4.0 or 5.0 for storage, peripherals, and adding cards. Again, many more details in the linked article, but a big question since Intel started teasing this hybrid CPU design was how it would work with software. And now we know that Alder Lake CPUs will have an integrated circuit that specifically monitors instructions and communicates with the OS to optimize scheduling based on a range of factors like power draw and frequency. This hardware plus software solution is called Intel Thread Director and will be supported in Windows 11, which will hopefully launch in time for Alder Lake. Lots of exciting news from Intel, and with that GPU news in particular, it sounds like Nvidia and AMD will now have a new Arc Nemesis. That's a horrible joke for the end there, by the way, Joe. Just let it fall flat if you want. Speaking of AMD GPUs, Team Red's open source unified Linux drivers have recently revealed that Radeon software devs are preparing for the advent of DisplayPort 2.0, the long-awaited update to the Vasus spec that hasn't been upgraded since 1.4a rolled out in 2016. DisplayPort 2.0 triples the bandwidth versus 1.4a, going from about 26 gigabits per second to 77.37, which is also significantly more than the most recent HDMI 2.1 spec that tops out at 48 gigabits per second. It's expected that AMD's still unannounced RDNA 3 family of GPUs will support this standard, but Intel's ARC GPUs will likely beat them to it if Intel hits their Q1 2022 launch goal. Pandemic delays pushed back products based on DP 2.0, which were originally planned for this year, but once they do launch in 2022, we'll have a whole new set of resolutions, color depths, and refresh rates to crush the hopes and dreams of any GPU that dares to call itself future-proof. Think triple 4K monitors at 144 Hz, or a single 8K 30 Hz display with 444 uncompressed HDR, or just a single 16K display with HDR at a resolution of 15,360 by 8,460. That's a lot of pixels. I hope DLSS or FSR or Intel's new XESS are really really good at upscaling. Last week, it was revealed that Gigabyte was hacked at the beginning of August, and 112 gigabytes of confidential data was being held at ransom. Well, Gigabyte apparently didn't want to pay up, so the hackers are trickling out Gigabyte's Gigabytes for all the world to see. The first set of docs showed details about AMD's Zen 4 CCDs and the LGA 1718 AM5 socket, and now we also know that Zen 4 server parts codenamed Genoa will have up to 96 cores and 192 threads each. Even though the Zen 4 CCD is 11% smaller than Zen 3, a larger package and socket size will allow AMD to fit 12 of them onto the substrate. Eight cores per CCD times 12 is 96. And this is just a mock-up, by the way, of going from 8 to 12 CCDs made by XFi over on Twitter. This also means Genoa will slot into an LGA 6096 socket. I feel like I should say nice after that. But it has a peak power draw of 700 watts for a one millisecond duration and an overall 400 watt TDP. Again, Lots of further details in the article if you desire further reading. Another bit of news ostensibly derived from the Gigabyte hack is a block diagram showing the AMD 600 series chipset, expected to pair with mainstream Zen 4 processors that will launch next year. The diagram only seems to indicate PCI Express 4.0 support. 
meaning Intel will be the only chip maker with support for PCIe 5.0 on a consumer platform via Alder Lake S for the foreseeable future. Some will say that 5 is better than 4, so Intel wins. Some will say that GPU gaming performance is all that counts, so it doesn't really matter. And others will point out that it's primarily a bandwidth bump, going from roughly 32 gigabytes per second each way with a Gen 4x16 slot to close to 64 gigabytes per second each way with a Gen 5 by 16 slot. And while GPUs don't even come close to saturating even PCI Express 4.0 bandwidth in a gaming workload, storage junkies will probably lean towards Intel since high performance SSDs can push those limits. If you're just gaming though, it really won't be a big deal. That's a lot about Intel and AMD, but what about Nvidia? Since revealing last week that their CEO Jensen Huang has effectively been rendered immortal by having his very being scanned and transferred into the digital realm, Team Green has only had some grumpy things to say. First, that ARM acquisition that they were so excited about hasn't quite been the race that they hoped for. After wrestling with UK regulators over national security concerns, the complex and ever-shifting amalgamation of software code and algorithms that is now Jensen Huang's consciousness told Financial Times that discussions are taking longer than initially thought, so it's pushing out the timetable. Nvidia did not intend to let the purchase of ARM rest for so long, but with a $40 billion price tag, it will cost them an arm and a leg if it does go through. For now, even for a digital being with near ultimate power, it still lies a length of space away, just beyond, just out of reaching range. There's a better phrase for that, I know, but I'm not gonna twist my arm trying to figure it out. Clearly dismayed with these arbitrary limitations of his power, Jensen followed up with more bad news. The GPU shortage, the one that plagues us all even after nearly a year, but has also conveniently led to an 85% year-over-year increase in NVIDIA's gaming revenue for Q2, will continue through the vast majority of 2022. That's next year, by the way, and NVIDIA blames us for being so enthusiastic about buying their products. We are our own worst enemy, it seems, and if only we didn't want to buy gaming GPUs so bad, there would be more gaming GPUs for us to buy. Jensen refers to this level of demand as great, because even a quasi-sentient compilation of ones and zeros knows what's good for the shareholders. Speaking of questionable sentience, Gigabyte and by extension Newegg have been under fire for the past week or two over power supplies of dubious quality. While initial reports go back about a year, Gigabyte's GP P750GM and 850GM power supplies are now confirmed to be poorly designed and even dangerous when used to supply power within their wattage specification, which is bad since simply pairing one with a GPU like a, an RTX 3090 could trigger the sparks and explosive qualities that Steve and Patrick experienced so viscerally. So it's a good thing that Newegg was forcing these PSUs into combos with RTX 3090s and other high power draw GPUs in the Newegg shuffle, a practice that they have come under fire for in the past because it's so evident that they're using high GPU demand in the shuffle system to jettison poor selling hardware like junk PSUs that explode instead of not exploding. Gigabyte, of course, has issued a full recall and apology to their customers while thanking Steve and his team for their diligent work. I'm just kidding. They made a half-assed statement calling GN's methodology into question. They have not issued a recall and Newegg changed their return policy so they can force lucky shuffle winners to return the entire combo, not just the crappy PSU, but the GPU that they actually wanted to buy, if they want an RMA that is. Quick PR lesson, Gigabyte and Newegg, before you had customers who were mad at you because of this crappy PSU situation. Now you have people who are mad at you who aren't even customers and weren't even directly affected by this because of how you're handling this. You're going the wrong way. Speaking of going the wrong way, sometimes I like to wear my tech briefs backwards just for better ventilation. Global Foundries though, the chip maker recently rumored to be in sales talks with Intel is apparently going the IPO route if confidential filings reported by Reuters are accurate. An SEC application will likely go public in October with the company's initial valuation being 25 billion US dollars. And depending on how fast the application is processed, Glofo might be public by late 2021 or early 2022 at which point they're also expected to push forward with plans to build a second fab near their Malta, New York headquarters. Windows 11 has ISOs now, at least for Windows insiders who can install the OS with a more out of the box like experience using the media creation tool. The ISO currently available uses build 22000.132, although test build 22000.160 has also been released with further updates, like the clock, which can now tell time. 
Actually, they built in a focus sessions setting that you can use to set yourself to a sort of do not disturb mode to actually get some goddamned work done without all these constant distractions. I approve. I do not approve of plagiarism though, and Fortnite has apparently just crossed that line in the eyes of a lot of people who play and develop the breakout hit game Among Us. Fortnite, unsatisfied with simply ripping off PUBG's battleground style play, has now introduced Imposters Mode, which is just Among Us with pretty much zero changes to how the game works. Even the ship maps from Among Us are just blatantly copied. You know, there's such a thing as doing an homage to another game within an existing game, but this is just lazy and the devs at Inner Sloth are not amused. I agree with them. Even if the best we can do about it is say, shame on you, Fortnite. They're probably too busy counting money to notice. How about some good gaming news though? Quake. The original version has now been remastered and is available on just about every platform out there, a fitting way to celebrate its 25th anniversary. PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC via Steam and Game Pass can now get Quake remastered, with PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series S and X versions coming at a later date. It costs 10 bucks and includes widescreen support, mildly enhanced models, better lighting and anti-aliasing, classic soundtracks, all previously released expansions, and online co-op and deathmatch multiplayer with cross-play support. Finally, all the world's energy problems have now been solved, or at least they were, for an almost imperceptible fraction of a second on August 8th, as the National Ignition Facility in Northern California used big frickin' lasers to generate over 10 quadrillion watts of power for 100 trillionths of a second. That's a lot of power for a very, very small amount of time, but crucially, it was able to ignite a self-sustaining chain reaction fusing more hydrogen atoms together and continuing the process of energy generation. That's fusion, folks, and they're getting close to the break-even point, where initiating those reactions will take less energy than they produce, leading to net positive power production and hopefully a nearly limitless source of clean energy in the future. I guess it's time to go rewatch The Saint and see how accurate it was. Or maybe Tombstone. Val Kilmer was really good in Tombstone. Getting distracted, though. Is that all? Yes, yes, that's all. There you have it, tech news for the week. And I desire your feedback, so please feel free to leave me a comment down below. While you're down there, all the articles I talked about today are linked in the description if you're interested in further reading. And you can also uh, click that like button if you enjoyed the video. Check out my store at paulsharbor.net for a selection of excellent merchandise options. Shirts, mugs, pint glasses, bottle openers, my new beer sets are back in stock. And subscribe to my channel if you'd like to see more videos like this one in the future. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you in the next video.